Hello, this is Cynthia Pankella, Director of Physician Services and Practice Management at the American Osteopathic Association. The purpose of this recorded webinar is to educate providers how to score an evaluation and management service based on documentation. Our speaker, Dr. Michael Warner, represents the AOA as an alternate advisor on the American Medical Association's Specialty Society Relative Value Scale Update Committee, known as RUC. He serves the American Academy of Professional Coders as a National Advisory Board member as well. Dr. Warner is board certified in family medicine by ACOFP and certified in neuromusculoskeletal medicine by AOB NMM. He is also a certified professional coder, a compliance officer, and a medical auditor. And we're very happy to have him present for you. Please welcome Dr. Michael Warner. Thank you, Cindy. Understanding how to score and evaluation and management, and understanding the scoring methodology reminds me of learning how to and eventually gaining great comfort in performing a neuro examination of the extremities. I found myself having to personally draw out my own score sheet for deep tendon reflexes, muscle strength, and sensation. And with clinical application, everything starts to make sense. The same goes for evaluation and management scoring when looking at documentation in a health record. Looking at someone else's score sheet will help you, but it's like looking at a neuro textbook. You know, it's just, it's just information, okay. But once you start your own score sheet and apply your skills, then you can look back at the textbook, such as Hoppenfeld's, and really appreciate the methodology. With this presentation, I will show you how to score an evaluation and management level of service and choose the appropriate CPT code. For our example today, we will evaluate a new patient with an ankle injury in an outpatient setting. With the principles we will review, you will be able to score any encounter. At the end, we will review coding of time as well. And please know that telemedicine and telehealth follow the same ENM guidelines. So let's recognize three key components when documenting a face to face encounter with medical record documentation. They include the history, examination, and medical decision-making. The history is comprised of the chief complaint, history of present illness, the status of chronic disease, review of systems, and past family social history. The chief complaint is a short blurb describing why the patient is seeking medical attention. Chief complaint can be back pain or diabetes care. It can also be a reevaluation or a follow up for a problem. Both 1995 and 1997 documentation guidelines require a chief complaint. The description should demonstrate why the person is seeking medical attention. Follow up or F up are not sufficient. History of present illness. The HPI is the equivalent of journalism's who, what, when, where, and how. History of present illness has eight components. They include location, where is it on your body? Quality, what does it look or feel like? Severity, how do you rate this problem, such as on a scale from zero to 10? Duration, how long have you had the problem? Timing, what time of the night or day does the problem occur? You kind of look at a clock to help with this one. Context, what are the circumstances that caused or provoked the problem? Modifying factors, what makes the problem better and or worse? And associated signs and symptoms, this allows for additional comments. The way to score the HPI is based on how many of these components are documented. One to three is a brief HPI, four or more is an extended HPI. Status of chronic condition or disease. Status is an alternative subset of the history of present illness. It was introduced in the 1997 ENM guidelines and was credited under both 1995 and 1997 guidelines by CMS on or after September 10, 2013. It may not make sense for a patient with diabetes mellitus to describe a chronic disease with the history of present illness components. For example, 
you know, having the person answer every time duration, how long have you had diabetes may not make as much sense as more important issues such as how the person is managing their disease. Status for the person with diabetes <clears throat> could include glucose readings, diet, exercise, medication adherence, and possible side effects. Status allows a patient to paint a picture of what it is like for them to have a disease or condition. Documentation information reflective of three or more chronic diseases is credited as an extended history of present illness. Review of systems is a head to toe mind body checklist. Review systems has 14 systems. Of interest, documentation guidelines permit a non provider staff member to ask and record the review of systems in the medical record. 14 components make up the review of systems. A problem, uh, or a, po a problem pertinent ROS is attained if one system is reviewed and documented. Two to nine systems equal an extended review of systems, and 10 systems yield a complete review of system. The final the history is past family social history. And it's important to think of it as past, family, social, as three separate components. Past includes prior major illnesses, injuries, prior operations, and prior hospitalizations. Past also includes the patient's medication list, allergy list, immunization status, and dietary status. Family includes age of death or living status of immediate family members. Social includes living arrangements, employment status, occupational history. Social also includes the use of alcohol, tobacco, or drugs, and if a child, exposure to secondhand smoke. Social includes educational level, sexual history, and any social event or occurrence impacting a patient's conditions. Just like review of systems, uh, guidelines permit a non provider staff member to gather and record past family social history information into the medical record. Now, a pertinent past family social history is if only one area, past, family, or social, is documented. A complete past family social history depends on whether the patient is new or established. If the patient is new to you, then you, only, then you need to document at least one element of each of all three, past, family, social. If the patient is established to you, generally meaning that to you or your practice, you've, you've seen the patient within the past three years, then you only need to document at least one level from two of the three, past or family or history, two of those three. Now, to determine the history level, you chart the history of present illness, review systems, and past family social history. And notice the wiggle room. No past family social history is required for problem-focused or expanded problem-focused histories. Also note that an extended HPI can result in either a detailed or a comprehensive history level. The history level, problem-focused, expanded problem-focused, detailed and comprehensive are all chosen based on the highest level of at least two of the three categories. Two of the three, HPI, ROS, past family social history. Take the highest two of those and that's how you determine uh, the history level. Now, when it comes to examination, there are two sets of guidelines that apply, 1995 and 1997. 1995 guidelines require documentation of a number of body areas or organ systems. 95 guidelines had some drawbacks because it was difficult to perform a detailed exam if addressing one body area. An eye exam, for example, required documentation of other body areas, you know, pretty much requiring a head-to-toe documentation in order to get a detailed exam. 1997 guidelines kept a multi-system general examination, but also includes 10 single organ system or specialty exams. 
1997 guidelines create alternative examination scoring so an eye exam can be done and credited with a higher intensity without having to do a head-to-toe exam. It's worth noting that you do not need to be an ophthalmologist or optometrist to perform and document an eye exam per 1997 guidelines. The same goes for a cardiovascular exam. You do not need to be a cardiologist uh, or any other. You don't need to be a specialist of any of the ones of the, of the examination shown. You can do them, and they have a, a different subset to them. 1995 examination criteria depends on how many body areas are examined and documented. And you will see that both expanded problem focused and detailed both have two to seven areas. Now, though CMS has not clarified the difference between these two, Medicare administrative contractors, such as Novitas, has defined a detailed examination as having documentation of two to seven areas, along with at least four items in four body areas or body systems. Coders call this the four by four rule. 1997 examination guidelines count the number of bullets and note that to reach a detailed level, some specialties such as psych and eye only require nine bullets. Medical decision-making. Medical decision-making is com composed of three areas. Number of diagnoses and or management options, amount of data and or complexity, and risk. Of interest, the medical decision-making scoring methodology was developed by the baiting testing of the Marshfield Clinic Health System in Wisconsin prior to the release of the 1995 guidelines. Medical decision-making scoring format is often called the Marshfield clinic scoring tool. Table A, the number of diagnoses and or management options, is based on points accumulated due to the condition. For example, a self-limited or minor condition gains one point. Established problem to provider, stable or improved, gains one point. An established problem to the provider but worsening gains two points. A new problem to the provider with no additional workup gains three points, and a new problem to the provider with additional workup gains four points. Additional workup can mean ordering an x-ray or a blood test or some type of scan. Table B. The amount of data and or complexity gains points on whether tests such as lab or radiographic tests are reviewed and or ordered. One point is gained if the results of a test are discussed with a performing physician. Another point is gained if a decision is made to obtain a old record or a decision is, is made to obtain a history from someone other than the patient. That's just the decision to do so. Two points are gained if old records are reviewed and summarized and or if the history is gained from someone other than the patient or, and or if the case is discussed with another healthcare provider. Two points are also gained if the provider independently visualizes an image, specimen, or tracing. Now this does not include reading a report, but actually, for example, reviewing an x-ray image, looking at it with your own eyes. Gaining these points also means that you are not charging for the professional fee for your work visualizing the x-ray, specimen, or tracing. So for example, let's say you obtain that x-ray of the ankle and you look at the x-ray and then it goes off to radiology for a final report. You can comment what you, uh, your observations from the x-ray and that goes towards these two points, but you're not charging for, for the professional service um, fee of, of reading the x-ray. Medical decision risk is based on three areas. The nature of the presenting problems or problem, diagnostic procedure or procedures ordered, and management options selected. These areas result in determination of a medical decision-making level from minimal to low to moderate to high. You will hear coders teach that medical necessity is the overarching factor for reimbursement and medical decision-making, the risk component is the driving determinant for determining the level of service. And you'll see how this plays out. 
So medical decision-making, minimal risk, includes things like a presenting problem, um, one self-limited or minor problem, such as a cold. Uh, diagnostic procedures ordered can be laboratory tests, such as a venipuncture, chest x-ray, EKG, urinalysis, ultrasound. Management options can be for minimal risk, rest, gargle, elastic bandages, superficial dressings. Medical decision-making moderate risk has presenting problem examples such as two or more self-limited problems or one stable chronic illness, you know, such as hypertension, or an acute uncomplicated illness or injury, such as a simple strain. Diagnostic procedures ordered can be physiologic tests not under stress or non-cardiovascular imaging or laboratory tests requiring an arterial puncture. And management options can include um, over-the-counter drugs, minor surgery, physical therapy, or IV fluids without additives. Now, medical decision-making high risk includes one or more chronic illnesses with mild exacerbation, progression, or side effects of treatment, or two or more stable chronic illnesses, or an undiagnosed new problem with uncertain prognosis, or an acute illness with systemic sim system, symptoms, or an acute complicated injury, such as a head injury with brief loss of consciousness. Diagnostic orders can include stress physiologic tests under stress, uh, diagnostic endoscopies with no identified risk factors, cardiovascular imaging studies with contrast and no identified risk factors, or obtaining fluid from a body cavity. Management options can include minor surgery with identified risk factors, elective major surgery with no identified risk factors, prescription drug management, IV fluids with additives, and closed treatment of fracture or dislocation without manipulation. That's the moderate. And here's the high. High is one or more illnesses with severe exacerbation, progression, or side effects and treatment. So you can see how we're progressing here from minimal to low to moderate to high, where, where everything's, everything's getting more intense. And this is why it's so important for what you document in the record, reflecting your care for the patient, and what's going on with the patient can make a big difference. Uh, so you know, acute or chronic illnesses and injuries that pose a threat to life or bodily function. Th this, is, this is imminent threat to life or body function. You know, you could see somebody with a kidney transplant and everything's stable, um, and that, that might not count for this if they're stable. Um, the uh, potential threat of, light, of uh, an abrupt change in neurologic status, such as seizures, TIA, weakness, sensory loss. For the diagnostic procedures ordered, uh, this is cardiovascular imaging studies with contrast, with identified risk factors, and uh, cardiac uh, electrophysiologic tests, diagnostic endoscopies with identified risk factors, and in management options, elective major surgery, um, emergency major surgery, drug therapy requiring intense monitoring for toxicity, and the decision not to resuscitate or to de-escalate care because of poor prognosis. Uh, for, 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 for taking uh, exams for AAPC in preparation, I've written these charts out multiple times, and it seems like every time I write it out, or even reading it to you now, it, 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 it just means something more because, it, you know, it really, wow, it really explains so much of, of a breadth of the patients that we see. So what you can see here is that <clears throat> when it comes to, to medical decision-making of risk, now in these fields, I, I don't have everything listed that we've, you know, th that it's on the Marshfield scoring, but, but here's examples. So you can see how, you know, for minimal, it's rest, gargle for management options, or for high, you can go down to the bottom of presenting uh, problems and, and see problems that pose threat to life or bodily function, or for diagnostic procedures, you know, moderate obtaining 
uh, fluid from a body cavity. This one is not two or three or three or three. This risk score is based on the highest you get for any one of these columns. Any one of these columns. And that's, that's important to know for this, for this methodology. So when we go to put together the medical decision making <clears throat> from straightforward, low, moderate, high, <clears throat> you're going to go based on the number of diagnoses, treatment options, the amount of data or, or reviewed or ordered, and you can see your score there, and the level of risk. So everything we did prior falls into this. And based on the highest two of three determines the level. And then once you determine this level, then you can go back and say, okay, now this is CPT levels for a new outpatient, uh, a, a, a new patient, an outpatient setting, 99201 through 99205. Now that you have your scoring for the history, for the exam, for the medical decision making, now you can finally plug it in here. And <laughs> if it's a new patient, it's three of three. So, so it's got to be the highest that all three allow you to get to. You could have one real high and the other two low, then the best you're going to do is they're going to be at a lower level. For an established patient, it's two of three. So you could take the two or three, either history exam, medical decision making, pick those two, the two highest, that's how you score it. And this 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 part of the methodology makes it makes it very uh, makes it very tricky, very tricky. So let's let's take an example. Here here is um, here's a patient who presents with right ankle pain. New patient, nineteen year old male, fell while skateboarding in a city park two hours ago and complains of burning in the right lateral right lateral ankle. Uh, pain worse with moving the ankle and mild pain with weight bearing. Better at rest and with elevation. Has applied ice, has not taken any medication. Denies striking his head or injuring other parts of the body upon falling. Okay, that's the HPI. Review systems. Overall feeling all right, except for the ankle injury. No dizziness or fainting spells. No heartburn, nausea, vomiting. No numbness in the toes. Mild swelling, right ankle. Okay. And past family social history. Appendectomy. You know, as a child, no chronic illnesses, takes no meds, no known drug allergies, denies tobacco, alcohol, recreational drug use, junior in high school, and a soccer player. Okay. So check out the, uh, check out the number of bullets here for the history of present illness. Context, you know, the skateboarding in a park. Duration, two hours ago. Quality, burning. Uh, location, right lateral ankle, uh, worse with moving ankle and, and weight bearing, uh, better with ice and elevation. That's modifying factors, what makes it better or worse. Um, and then deny striking head or other injuries. Okay, associated signs and symptoms. That, that's four or more. So this is an extended HPI. Let's go to review of systems. How many systems? Well, constitutional, overall, musculoskeletal, neurologic, gastro. Lymphatic. Okay. All right. So we're in an extended review of systems. Okay. Past family social history. All right. Well, we have past and, uh, and we have social. There's no, there's no family. There's no family history here at all. So we only have two or three. So that means that it's a pertinent. In order to be a complete, we would have had some kind of uh, uh, documentation of, of, of family history, but we don't have that. Okay, so it's pertinent. And then we come to our to our history grid, and we see that we have a uh, an HPI that's extended. We have a review system that's extended, and we have a past family social history that's pertinent. So that's a detailed history. Okay, detailed history. So overall, um, now we go to the to the exam. And we add up these bullets, constitutional, eyes, musculoskeletal, lymphatic, neurologic, psych. And, uh, you know, we're, we're at expanded problem focused. It's, it's interesting to know that with the uh, 1997 guidelines, 
uh, cardiology includes swelling of the feet. So a lot of coders will, will really want you when you when you when you document lymphatic to document on more than one body area. So you know, no swelling in hands or four feet. Okay, okay, more than one area. That's ex that's an exam expanded problem focused. Then we go to medical decision making. And uh, you know, medical decision making documents of a sprain and an unspecified ligament in the right ankle with code S93 401A. There's not a specific code for the anterior talofibular ligament. Uh, maybe ICD 12 or 13 will we'll finally have that. The A is, is at the end showing th that this is the initial counter and not a subsequent. Note the code V00128 for an injury while skateboarding and Y92.830 for it occurring in a public park. And you can see eventually when scoring is, you know, eventually when this is made easier and, and we can all have the ability and time to put full coding in, it's going to have a really, oh, wow. Imagine the, the, the data analytics that are going to happen when, when eventually we can go this deep with coding. But, and if you were taking a coding examination test, let's say to be a CPC, uh, you would need to record all these codes consistently. The plan reflects the provider's viewing of the x-ray and the observation of no evidence of fracture. Crutches are ordered. The patient is to follow up with his PCP and uh, take over the counter ibuprofen. Okay. The patient is also to continue elevating the right foot, use ice, and use an ACE wrap. All right. Also note the medical record is signed by the provider. So table A, four points. Uh, due to a new problem with additional workup, you did the x-ray. Table B, three points, one from the x-ray order and another two for independent visualization and reporting of what you saw in the x-ray. <clears throat> and C, low, uh, due to the management option of over-the-counter ibuprofen. So this revolt, results in a low medical decision-making level. And uh, remember, this chart requires the highest level um, ba based on, based on, on two columns. So for this patient, for this new patient in an outpatient setting, detailed history, expanded problem focused examination and low medical decision making. This is a 99202. And I advise you to acquire a score sheet. Uh, there are plenty available online and we'll solicit some when we post this. And, and eventually, um, you know, you'll put together your own score sheet. You could also talk to your local certified professional coder. You know, the American Academy of Professional Coders has 500 local chapters throughout the country. So it would not, it would not be hard to find one and, and find someone that you can acquire to, to get a score sheet. And I find that I only need to make, I find that I need to make my own score sheet with the information present, presented in this webinar. Um, you know, to ultimately understand it and you can take somebody else's, but it's, it's just like the neuro exam, D10 re reflexes. For me, you eventually have to draw it all out yourself before you see how it really works. But people do this consistently. Coders, auditors, they can use that score sheet and, uh, and go right through this like, like any of us clinically would do a neuro exam. And while we address criteria for new and established patients in an outpatient setting, this information will help you understand with memos in your CPT manual, how to score any encounter service. So rather, rather than score based on the number of items or bullets documented, you also have the option of billing based on time. Now, if you do bill based on time, then over 50% of the encounter time in the outpatient setting must be spent counseling and or coordinating care. So let's say you see a female patient who was recently diagnosed with breast cancer. And she comes to your office with her spouse and she is not sure what to do. The breast surgeon recommends surgery and the patient is overwhelmed. And you spend 30 minutes discussing the issue with the patient and her family member. You, 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 help, you help them understand the options and create a treatment plan. For this established patient, you might document 30 minutes spent face-to-face -face discussing breast cancer treatment options with the patient and her husband with over 50% counseling and coordination of care. The patient wishes to visit her former college roommate, who is also a breast surgeon, in a city two hours away. 
Okay. Um, we discussed the treatment options, and I support her wish to obtain another opinion. Coding rules do not mandate a stop and start time. Um, there's nothing wrong, however, with recording the time as it may turn out longer than you suspect. In clinical practice, a scenario like this, you know, like with this patient with cancer, it, it happens. And there is not much need to document a full history, location, duration, context, you know, all that. And, and that little sentence about, you know, the patient wants to go see, get a second opinion in what she's discussing, that, 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 that tells the story. That tells anyone reading the record can figure out what's going on. And that suffices for the time code. Prolonged service codes also exist. And these are the codes for direct contact and prolonged service. So let's say you see a patient and conduct an E&M and, the, and it just takes, it takes longer than usual. Uh, you can use these codes on top of your ENM level of service code. And please note that these codes only come into effect if the prolonged time is over 30 minutes beyond the typical time for the ENM visit. Now, these are the manuals you want to use and reference when coding and documenting in the medical record. Uh, they include the CPT manual, which is the current procedural terminology. Um, the ICD manual, which is the International Classification of Disease, version 10, with clinical modification. And the HCPCS manual, the Healthcare Common Procedure Coding System. It is important that you reference the manuals with the same calendar year as the date of service. So if you are reviewing coding or documentation from a health record from 2017, then you need to reference manuals from 2017. Similarly, once a year, when, when the new year occurs, you need to start using the newest set of manuals. So in summary, just know that there are three key components, history, examination, medical decision-making. And I wish you luck with putting together your score sheet and I invite you to re-watch parts of this video if you need to in order to better understand evaluation and management scoring methodology. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, I, I appreciate you uh, watching the seminar. Thank you so much. And thank you, Cindy, for allowing us to, to put this on through the AOA. Thank you, Dr. Warner.